This live presentation was produced in Ashland, Oregon by the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library and Event Center. RVML relies on the support of our volunteers, members, and donors to organize and present these programs. For more information about this presentation or to borrow, download, or purchase other recordings from our catalog, please visit our website at rvml.org. From the east, house of light, may wisdom dawn on us so we may see all things in clarity. From the north, house of night, May wisdom ripen in us, so we may know all from within. From the West, house of transformation, may wisdom be transformed into right action, so we may do what must be done. From the south, house of the eternal sun, may right action reap the harvest, so we may enjoy the fruits of planetary being. From above, house of heaven, where star people and ancestors gather, may their blessings come to us now. From below, house of earth, may the heartbeat of her crystal core bless us with harmonies to end all war. <laughs> From the center, galactic source, which is everywhere at once, May everything be known as the light of mutual love. Ayum hunabku evam maya emaho. Ayum hunabku evam maya emaho. Ayum hunabku evam maya emaho.
Good evening. <laughs> um, I very much appreciated the introduction, the uh, welcome to Ashland. And it's true, I've been here for a little while, maybe half a year. And uh, we, we had the opening last week of the Time is Art Gallery, which is the headquarters of the Foundation for the Law of Time, which is a nonprofit um, organization which is dedicated to the spreading and the promotion of an understanding about the law of time and the 13 moon calendar and the 13 moon calendar change peace plan. We are living, as we all know, in a most interesting time. These are from the Mayan perspective, if not from other perspectives. These are the end times. Uh, this is the time of prophecy. And just about everybody has heard of the date 2012. Most people, you say, 2012, and they go, hmm, is that when the Mayan calendar ends? <laughs> That's the stock answer. <laughs> the Mayan calendar doesn't end in 2012. The Mayan calendar uh, is based on cycles and cycles and cycles. What happens in 2012 is this ending of a major cycle. For some reason or other, the 2012 date, more than any other date of prophecies, has stuck in people's mind and imagination. It's a marker. It's true. It's a wake-up call in our DNA. Why is this? For the Maya, 2012 is the ending of what's usually referred to as the Great Cycle. The Great Cycle is a 5,000 125-year cycle that began actually at the date 13.0.0.0.0 on the Mayan calendar. On the Gregorian-Julian calendar, that date is August 13th BC 3113. What happened at that point? If you go look back in your history books, you can find uh, most Western history books say the history of civilization began about 3100 BC. That's 13 years off from the Mayan long count, which says, no, to be precise, according to your calendar, that would be August 13th, 3113 BC. The present Kali Yuga cycle of the Hindus began just 11 years later in 3102 BC. That's supposedly when uh, Lord Krishna disincarnated and then the Kali Yuga began. Kali Yuga is the final age and the darkest age. For the Maya, history did begin at 3113 BC. The first dynasty of Egypt was established circa 3100 BC. The first city in history was founded circa 3100 BC. That was the city of Uruk, right, from which name Iraq is derived. Uruk was founded by seven wise men at the beginning of history in Mesopotamia. This, if you look at the history books, you'll see that virtually everything that we think of as the history of civilization began at that point and slowly builds up from there. That's the Babylonian Mesopotamian origin of civilization. The Mayans say that this whole cycle of civilization, 5,125 years, comes to an end on the winter solstice, December 21st, 2012 AD. That now is maybe a little less than nine years away not very far away. Everyone was all keyed up when 2000 was going to happen with the famous 
Y2K flop. And then they breathed a sigh of relief and said, Phew, the apocalypse isn't going to happen after all. Not yet, anyway. And then came 9-11, 2001. Well, there was a lot of bickering. I don't know if you read it in the papers or not. But when did the, when did the third millennium really begin? And uh, the third millennium officially began on January 1st, 2001. So 2001 was the first year, actually, of the third millennium. Up to that point, everyone was saying, well, we made it through the second millennium. The apocalypse didn't happen yet. If you read in the book of Revelations, it talks about the thousand-year millennia. And so the third millennium dawned. Well, before the first year of the third millennium was over, there was a big, big, big event, which everyone is quite acutely aware of, which was known as the 9-11. And the 9-11 event was the apocalyptic event to set the tone for the fact that we are now all on the road to 2012. All the signs point to 2012. No one, uh, no one gets past, uh, past that point uh, into the future without going through December 21st, 2012. What does that mean, the end of the cycle? Well, what is actually going on right now in the world that, that gives us any clue of why things are happening the way they are happening right now? And who were the ancient Maya that they knew these things so well? December 21st, 2012, and the long count will be 13.0.0.0.0 once again. A cycle will be complete. A cycle of what are called 13 baktuns. A baktun, there are 13 baktuns between 3113 BC and 2012. A baktun is a cycle of exactly 144,000 days. 13 cycles of 144,000 days, and you come to the completion of the cycle. This cycle, this is what we call the cycle of history, the cycle of civilization. This cycle is a very, very interesting one in the history of the Earth, in the evolution of the solar system, and even in the history of the galaxy. Why this little planet? Why us, who are we, what are we doing here, and how did we get into this predicament? <laughs> because indeed, it appears to be quite a predicament that we are in today. It has become very, very unpleasant to go flying. It, it is a very, very um, terrible sight to go to a little place like Medford Rogue Valley International Airport and see people who are your dental assistant or the insurance agent being frisked like they're terrorists. There's no common sense to that. None whatsoever. And that's just a little airport. As you know, it gets much worse when you go to the larger airports. So we, our, our, our sense of freedom has been greatly diminished. Uh, our sense of security and comfort has greatly diminished. Our common sense is truly diminished. We are, uh, for all intents and purposes, um, a people uh, collectively rather insane. I often observe that uh, the other species don't do this to each other. We, are, we seem to be very curious species. We're very paranoid, uh, given to uh, very extreme forms of aggression, uh, who are reliant on artificial 
contrivances to, a, to an extraordinary degree. We are, we, any new technology that is invented, we immediately become addicted to it. It's interesting, this cycle of history, 5,125 years, it's also the ending of a larger cycle, a cycle of almost 26,000 years. That's usually referred to as the Pleiadian Great Year. So that cycle also ends on December 21st, 2012. Now that's a long cycle. And then there's a larger cycle than that that ends on December 21st, 2012. A cycle of 104,000 years. All these cycles are coming to a conclusion, to a convergent point in 2012. Who are we? What are we doing here? This is the most important question that we have to ask ourselves today. This is a sensitive town, and this is a sensitive audience. When you consider how large Ashland is, that uh, we would have this kind of, this kind of interest in issues like this. Usually the questions of who are we and what are we doing here are not asked in the, in the halls of Congress or in the White House or in the <laughs> Pentagon. What we're doing here from, from that point of view is to uh, great, gain greater power and dominance over the rest of the world. And it's a very, very um, a very interesting, very sad state that we that we have fallen in as a nation in in that regard. That our policies are now uh, in such a militaristic um, uh, condition. Why is that? As I said, who are we, and what are we doing here? Twenty-six thousand years ago. What was happening here? It was probably really, really just totally stunningly natural. Probably a few, few uh, natives had trekked their way down across the Bering Strait, checked out a cave or two here and there, but not too many of them. And then even 5,125 years ago, if we came to, to the Rogue Valley, what would it look like? Probably not too much different than what it looked like 26,000 years ago. A little warmer, a little less ice. Our species seems to be the most recent one on this planet the most recent one evolved. We pride ourselves on being the most intelligent and the most clever, which in some ways it seems like we are. We can build skyscrapers and we can build airplanes to hit the skyscrapers. <laughs> <laughs> Intentionally. We can build machines that supposedly think for us and think faster than us. I read a statement of one of the major movers behind globalization. He said, it used to be, we used to live in a world where the big ate the small, and now we live in a world where, where the um, faster eat the slower. <laughs> we live in a very fast world. We live in a world of accelerating time. Most people nowadays notice that they don't have enough time to do everything that needs to be done. <laughs> there are more things to do and less time to do it in. Though we have faster machines, faster vehicles, and no matter how fast we go, we still can't get, any, can't get it all done. We're like, kind of like the, like the um, paradox, the Greek paradox of if you go, if you have to, to get from X to Y, and you go one day, you go, half the distance, the next day another half the distance, another day another half the distance, you never get there. That's, that's how, how we are. Where are we going so fast? What do, what do we have to do that's so important that we're going so fast? Why 
is the time accelerating so fast? Is it because there's more people? What was the pop? How many people, how many humans were there when Homo sapiens came about 26,000 years ago? How many Homo sapiens were there? A million? Who knows? A couple million? It's said that 5,125 years ago, when history began, they estimated that there were the history of civilization, that is, modern civilization, Babylonian civilization, that maybe there were 100 million human beings all around the planet. That was, that was in 3113 BC. They estimate that at the peak of the Roman Empire, that number in some 3,000 years had gone from 100 million to about 300 million. Slow growth. From the time of Julius Caesar to the time of Sir Isaac Newton, population went from around 300 million to 500 million. The time when, that's about the time, I should say a little later than Isaac Newton, about the time of the uh, Benjamin Franklin talking to the Iroquois Indians around 1750. There were about 500 million human beings then. And that was from, in other words, from 3113 BC to 1750 AD. That's uh, almost 5,000 years. The population went from 100 million to, to 500 million in, in almost 5,000 years. But in the 250 years since 1750, the human population has increased over 12-fold. That's an amazing. When you, when you graph that out, that time span, what you see is an exponential curve. In, eight, in 1750, there were 500 million people. In 1840, 90 years later, the population doubled for the first time in that short a time, from 500 million to a billion. From 1840 to 1930, another 90 years, it went to 2 billion. 1930 wasn't so long ago that some people here probably can remember 1930. <laughs> uh, it's increased. Since, since 1930, from 2 billion, now it's well over 6 billion. In 1960, which a lot of us remember, okay, <laughs> okay. 1960, there were 3 billion. That was a little over, that was 45 years ago. We've doubled. You just really have to think about that. 1975, it was 4 billion. 1987 or so, it was 5 billion. And 19, around 2000, we went over 6 billion. And now we're going 6, almost 6 and a quarter billion. They figure 7 billion by 2010. The environmental impact of that, of course, is totally incredible. It's really amazing to think that people don't think that we have any effect on the environment. They still think that we have nothing to do with global warming. What is going on? That's quite amazing. How did that happen? How many people are wearing a watch? Raise your hands. Come on, raise them. Watch wearers, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. Where did that watch come from? Yeah. Now, there, this is where your watch came from. Um, actually, in 3100 BC, the Sumerians, who lived in Uruk, divided, they knew the world was a sphere, they knew it was a round, and they divided that sphere into 24 parts. And each part 
had 60 minutes and each minute had 60 seconds. That was already 30, that was exactly in 3100 BC. It took a long time. How did they know that? That's another interesting question. But they did. That's verified knowledge. They knew that. It took a very long time before the human beings could actually experientially verify that, 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 that the Earth really was round like that with the, with the means that they had. It took almost um, 4,500 years before they could actually really verify that. But that division of that sphere into 24 parts, each part 60 minutes, each minute 60 seconds, It took 3,000 some odd years before uh, it, was how it was figured out how to, how to apply that, how to make that work into what was called a concept of time. In the court of Harun al-Rashid in Baghdad, around 800, the great caliph playing chess <laughs> heard that there was a new Roman emperor in the West, a man named Charlemagne. And he said to some of his court wizards, let's bring him some gifts. He needs to be honored. So the wizards of the court of Harun al-Rashid got together a lot of gifts, including one of them, which is, what is that thing there? Oh, that's a little mechanical clock. It's not, you know, it's just a toy. It has no soul. Good, give that to Charlemagne. So Charlemagne received, among other gifts, the soulless clock of Harun al-Rashid. Charlemagne didn't know what to do with it, but some Christian monks looked at it and said, hmm, we're supposed to wake up and pray several times after midnight before the sun rises. Maybe we can use this to figure out how to wake up at those moments. So they did, they started working on it by, that was around 800 AD, by 1000, the, the, Switzerland, they came up with the cuckoo clock. So the monks could wake up, cuckoo, okay. <laughs> Time to pray. The military also got interested in that little device. And around, around 1600 or so, that was perfected. Precision, pendulum clock. So they had a 24 hour clock based on 60 minutes, 60 seconds. If that clock, when you look at it, any clock, the original ones, or any clock actually, what you're seeing is a, a two-dimensional plane in space, a circle divided into 12 parts and with two little hands, sometimes a second hand too, the original one. And the, the two hands go around, one of them goes around faster than the other one, and one of them only moves one twelfth of a, of a, of a circle in an hour, while the other one um, moves, moves uh, more quickly than that counting the minutes. Who came up with that idea? What is this, what does a two-dimensional circle, a plane in space, have to do with time? And what is that actually measuring? And is there such a thing as an hour in nature? There is no such thing as an hour in nature, and there's no such thing as a minute in nature. These are absolutely abstract and artificial concepts. About the same time that that clock was perfected, there was a pope in the Vatican named Pope Gregory the Thirteenth. Uh, ben, that means that there are 12 Pope Gregories before him. The first one is the famous 
Pope Gregory I, around 600 A.D., same time as Muhammad, who really established the Vatican as a major organization. Pope Gregory XIII was elected Pope in 1872. What was going in, excuse me, in 1572? What was going on in 1572 when Pope Gregory XIII was elected Pope? A certain Bishop Delanda, the very same year that he was elected Pope, was sent back to the Yucatan. Bishop Delanda had been the Bishop of Yucatan in, in the, from the 1540s up to 1562. The Spaniards, as you know, arrived in, in, in Mexico in 1519. And in 1562, there was a major burning of all the books of the Mayan civilization by Bishop Delanda in a town called Isamal in Yucatan. Isamal was the main pilgrimage and a religious ceremonial center of the Maya at that time. So Bishop Delanda burnt the books, and then as soon as he burnt the books, he was called back. And the church wanted to know what he had learned. And what he had learned, among other things, he wrote down in 1572, he wrote a book the same year that the Pope was elected, and he went back to Mexico, to Yucatan. His book was called The Relation of the Things of Yucatan, which is the first book by a European about the Mayan people. And it's the first book by a European that also talks about the Mayan calendar. What did they find? They found that the Mayan calendar was more accurate than the Julian calendar, the calendar invented by Julius Caesar, which was used by the church then. They found out that the Julian calendar was was off by 10 days. That spring equinox was falling closer on their, that calendar, closer to April 1st or something like that. And that the Mayan calendar was more sophisticated and more accurate. So what did Pope Gregory I decide to do when he became elected Pope? He decided to reform the Julian calendar. He said, we'll make our calendar as accurate as that heathen calendar was. And so it took him 10 years, and he figured out how to make it more accurate, one less leap year every, four, one less leap year every 400 years. <laughs> That's the essence of the Gregorian calendar reform. And we call it the Gregorian calendar after Pope Gregory. 1582, the job was done. The, the great reform was completed. If you went to bed on October 5th, you woke up on October 16th. They took back the 10 days that they were off. It's interesting to note that that would not have happened if the Spaniards hadn't conquered the Mayans, committed genocide, and destroyed their books. The combination, if you look at that calendar, it's a 12-month calendar, and we've got a clock with a face with 12 hours on it. 12. What's the superstitious number? 13. So here was divisions of time based on 12. What, what was the most common division of time before history? What we now find out is that most people before what's called history used a 13-month, 28-day calendar. You still find the Druids using that. The Druids used that. The, the Inca populations of South America still use a 13-month calendar. This is the year 5,512 on that calendar. Why was the number 13 suppressed? Why do we have, you know, our, the civilization suffers not so much nowadays, but quite a bit more recently from a great disease called trisdecaphobia, fear of the number 13. You still go to older apartment houses in New York City and you take the elevator and it goes from the 12th to the 14th floor. That's real trisdecaphobia. The Mayan 
calendar system is based on the number 13, as was all the earlier systems. 13 is the, is the number of the cosmic movement of time. 12 is what's called a static number. It's, it's a perfect multiple of 3, 4, 2, and 6. It has no motion with inside it. it, it, it if you think of it abstractly, it creates an inter, interlocking set of, of uh, planes. Of those, of those factors, two, um, uh, six, three, and four. Thirteen is a prime number. The moon actually goes around the Earth 13 times a year. This is also scientific. The actual cycle of the moon, from new moon to new moon, is 29 and a half days. That's called the, the synodic cycle. The, but the sidereal cycle, See, this is where it messes with your head. The sidereal cycle of the moon, that's from where the moon appears in the sky to when it appears in the same place again, is 27 days. That's because we're looking from down here on Earth. If you're up in space, you're seeing it. The moon is going around the Earth 13 times in the time the Earth goes around the sun once. What happens when people base their sense of time on perceptions that are uh, artificial, mechanistic, arbitrary, and also irrational and irregular. As we know, the Gregorian calendar, 30 days have September, April, June, and November, all the rest have 31 except for February, which has 28, except on leap years when it has 29. And that's as much as you learn about the calendar, if you can remember that. Why, if we are a rational scientific civilization, do we use a contrivance like that? You can read any books about the calendar, and there's, there's nothing but apologies for that fact. No one understands what kind of deep effect that has on our unconscious on our social programming. What is a calendar? A calendar is the principal instrument used to program a society's customs. If you took away the Gregorian calendar, just destroyed it, obliterated it, said, what are you, where are you going to find July 4th and Christmas? All of those, and, and you know, when those dates come around, you know, if, if you see, you can see the fever building up. Even if you don't want to be part of it, if you want to stay away from it, you can't, you know, it's there. Pretty soon, you know, you've got your Christmas depression. <laughs> you didn't want to have your Christmas depression again. <laughs> but that's... The, the, all of, all of this, all the, everything that a society, a culture, a people does is programmed into the calendar. The calendar is the macro programming device of a society or a culture. Take away the Chinese calendar and, and uh, or take away the Jewish calendar, or take away the Islamic calendar, all the festivals, all the customs, everything, gone. That's the, the, <laughs> And you can see, well, that's how, how totally, um, uh, in some ways, very relative and arbitrary these programming devices are. Coffee. First cultivated by the Mayans. <laughs> You know, you can read Scientific American magazine and they'll come up with things like, have an article and say, on September 21st, 75 million BC in the Jurassic, a pterodactyl stepped on a fern and, well, September 21st, 75 million BC, that didn't exist. Pterodactyls weren't using that calendar, that's just a projection. (laughs) 
these are programs that are so ingrained in our mind, it's really almost impossible to think of life without them. And yet they're totally arbitrary. So from one place to another, and, and it's one place that doesn't mean anything, another place that they're all totally, totally hooked on what's happening in that way. That's very, very interesting. Do you know how many calendars are, in, are used by people in the world today? It's still, still quite, quite a great number of, of calendars. So the, the, like, like everything else in terms of biodiversity, the use of calendars has shrunk. <laughs> and the dominant calendar, the, the global standard, the world standard calendar, is the Gregorian calendar. I often ask people, do you like living on the Vatican's time? <laughs> this, is, this is what it is, okay? Uh, you can read Vatican church books about the calendar in the late 19th and early 20th century, and one of the things they're really, really proud of is that even though most of the people in the world aren't Catholic, they're using their calendar and living on their time. Why are we using that calendar? Simply because of the flukes of history. History is written by the, by the, by the people who dominate, by the people who conquer, by the people who win. And the uh, Gregorian calendar happened to be the, the the calendar of the dominant civilization. The Gregorian calendar was, was, reform was created at that time also to impose it on the conquered indigenous peoples. So what was the Mayan calendar? And what is that? And what does that have to do with today? We started talking about 2012, despite the fact that we live in a Gregorian dominated world, 2012 rings bells with just about everybody. Uh, see? <laughs> Told you. It's in our DNA. It's even in the cell phone system. <laughs> and and also to 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 answer the question, why 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 did it happen that that we went and our population from half a billion 250 years ago, a 12-fold to over 6 billion today. A calendar is a programming device, and so is the clock. A clock is the, is the micro-programming device, and the calendar is the macro. The, the, the macro schedules you out for what's, what's called a year. What is a year, actually? People think of a year is when you take down one calendar and you put up the next year's calendar. The only reason you need a next year's calendar is because that calendar is screwy. <laughs> and January 1st might have been a Saturday last year, but you're not sure what day it's going to be next year. <laughs> so, you, so it keeps hallmark industry in business. But that's not what a, a year is the time it takes the earth to go around the sun once. That's a, that's a, a, year, a year is a measure, an orbital measure. If you want, if you want standard of measure, you want even units of measure. And you want the units to correspond, 30, 31, 30, etc. is not even units of measure. And the micro units in that, the seven weeks, they don't measure up with the macro units, the months. So, it, it gets all screwy. Today is Friday, January 30th. Well, of course, there won't be a February 30th, but what day of the week will March 30th be? Right now, most people don't have a clue. So all those, nothing, nothing measures up. And so it's, it, you, you can't do calculations very fast on it. That's why you've got to take out your, either your day timer or whatever and look it up. The clock, and that's, that's, that's the programming device. You can see how that programs us for a certain amount of confusion. It's at a very subtle, unconscious level, but it's pervasive. And then the clock is the micro-programming device. I got 10 minutes to go. 
I'll meet you at a quarter to. So, and it's, okay, your hour's up, you owe me $400. <laughs> Everything, and of course, then that gets to the other thing. The philosophy, time is money. So everything, absolutely everything in the society is prorated according to the clock, the calendar. Everything is prorated as money according to the clock. When was the, the clock was invented, it came to perfection early in the 17th century. Not too long after that, the first stock markets and banks. The combination of an irregular calendar irrational calendar as well, since no one can tell me what February means. And October is the tenth month, but it means eight. Uh, we're programmed for, for irrationality, irrational laws, irrational customs. Combination of an irregular, irrational standard of measure, which is not really a standard of measure, with a with a uh, artificial mechanistic clock creates an unconscious timing frequency which governs the pace of the society that's why we're accelerating the gregorian calendar is hopelessly entropic and the mechanistic clock like the like the paradox of going half a distance, half a distance, half a distance, never getting there, uh, creates smaller and smaller micro units, which cause us to accelerate. We're on the now, we're on the nanoseconds, and the nanotechnology. So that that's, that represents an actual acceleration. So what you have is the combination of the of the of the irregular clock and the of the irregular calendar and the mechanical clock. And, the, and the, uh, that results in the creation of the machine technology called industrialism. The, the clock was the first machine. You have to really remember that. From that machine, all other machines became possible. The basis of all machines. That's why we've, everyone punches in by the clock. Everything is run by the clock. People, you know, I say, well, throw the clock away, and people say, well, how would I find out when my plane's going to leave? And that's the point. Everything is based on the clock. Absolutely everything. And the clock is accelerating. The clock created the, created the machine, the machine beginning in the Industrial Revolution 250 years ago. That's when the population starts to increase. Why? Because unconsciously the human DNA is accelerating. Once you create a, a, a machine technology and a machine culture, you have an uprooting of people from the what are called rural areas to go to the, to the urban areas to work in the machines. The machines, every generation of machines since then, since 1750, every generation of machine goes faster and faster. As the machine has propagates and multiplies just like like any other biological organism. It's a function of the human being. The human being multiplies and propagates. The machine multiplies and propagates. The machine usually has a shorter life than the human. So the generations of machines are faster. As the generation of machines go faster and the, and the speed of the machine accelerates, so the human being goes faster. The population goes faster. You need more people to run more machines. And then you soon have an absolutely run-away situation because the machine depends on natural resources, which creates the stock markets, the commodities markets, and uh, the creation of artificial forms of transportation. First the, first the steam locomotive, and then the auto, and then the, uh, the automobile, the great shipping industries, and then finally the, the airline industry. And that, that creates uh, uh, havoc 
on the environment. As, and, if, and you have to realize that not only is the machine ex being extruded by the human organism faster and faster, but it's needing more and more natural resources and creating more and more waste. The fact is that the human technological civilization uses resources faster than they can be replaced and creates more waste than can be taken care of. If you think about that for a little bit, so there's going to be one point there where there's no resources and nothing but waste. So it's really fortunate that 2012 was such a short time away. Because we, are, we, are, we have hit an exponential curve. The 9-11 the was the puncture in the technosphere that, that said you've reached your limit. You better start rethinking how you're doing things. We think that this person was responsible or that person was responsible or the Al-Qaeda or the CIA or whoever did it. But the fact is that from a higher point of view, that was an, uh, the, it was just it was an in, it was an inevitable event. It was an inevitable event because the human species had reached the limits of its growth of devouring the biosphere, its natural habitat. And a signal was sent then through the civilization to indicate that that moment had come. The, rea the reaction, you could have had any reactions at that moment. They said, wow, are we so bad that, that we caused other people to do that to us? <laughs> Why did this happen? No, immediately the first thing to do was attack Afghanistan. <laughs> it seemed to have very little to do with it. And then second, prepare for war because Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction which Colin Powell now says he didn't. Now those are, those are um, uh, defensive retrenchment reactions. And they're really defensive retrenchment against the, the fear of the loss of control of the machine. Because that's really what the underlying script is. So we have to face the fact that as a species, we have reached our limits of artificial technology and, and machine technology. Because if you could see a, a time-lapse movie of the Earth from 1750 to 2004, you see the time-lapse photography of the Earth, you'd see this cancerous invasion devouring forests, polluting the skies, polluting the ocean, spreading out everywhere in greater and greater numbers, in greater and greater concentration until you reach a point where we are today. How much farther will it go? How much more can the, can the ionosphere take? How much more global warming can, can it take? You read the other day that they're expecting one third of the species to go extinct because of global warming. Well, enough has already happened. We have already irrevocably altered our evolution and the evolution of the Earth. But the law of time, the law of time is based on the knowledge of the Mayan calendar. If you go to Kitt Peak Observatory outside of Tucson, Arizona, big array of telescopes, including the Vatican's official telescope. On the side of the visitor's building, there's a mosaic mural of Mayan civilization. And then the text says, among other things, that the Mayan calendar was more accurate and precise than the calendar we use today. Now, I looked at that and said, well, that's true, and these people are scientists, why don't they use it? Because, because of the calendar that we have, it's a programming device. You 
get rid of this calendar, you get rid of the program. If you want to have a really radical revolution, get rid of the calendar. That will revolutionize everything very fast. The law of time is rooted in the knowledge of the Mayan calendar, more precise and scientific than the calendar we use today. Who were the Maya? At their heyday, 1,300 years ago, the Mayan civilization throughout Central America and Southern Mexico had a very elaborate civilization, which called Stone Age. They didn't have metallurgy, late Neolithic, but fantastic hieroglyphic writing, and the most incredible mathematical, calendrical, astronom astronomical system on Earth. The mathematics was based not on 10 decimal, but on 20 vigesimal. And that gave them, uh, and also a positional zero, which gave them a great advantage in computation of large astronomical numbers. And they used at least 17 or 19 calendars simultaneously. Oh, what was that about? They knew that time is not what's measured by a clock. Time is not money. Time is not dependent or based on an irregular measure of 12 months, because 12 doesn't go into 365 or 364 at all. They knew that time is the universal factor of synchronization. Time is the cause of synchronicity. Synchronicity is the actual nature of the universe. Their mathematics, they understood through the use of the different calendars, calendars that synchronized the Earth, the Moon, Mars, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, the Pleiades, Arcturus, Sirius, All synchronized. So they took measurements of synchronicity. That's radically different from our concept of time. Our concept of time is linear, mechanistic, and entropic. And it's since we're all hooked on it, it's taking us with it and leading us into a black hole of consciousness. The minds knew that time is a factor of synchronicity, universal factor of synchronization. The Maya, the original Maya, I believe, were interdimensional galactic travelers. They had been scoping out the, the solar system and this part of the galaxy for a very long time. There had been in a number of other systems. And they came to this system here, probably around uh, the time of the birth of the Buddha, 2,500 years ago. They, they created a, 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 a civilization in Mesoamerica, far away from Babylonia, where they could uh, develop their time science experiments in the synchronization of this planet with the rest of the solar system and the rest of this part of the galaxy. When they, their civilization blended in with the other shamanic cultures of that area, and when they, they knew exactly when the point of, of Babylonian history began, that was correspondent to what they call the beginning of the Great Cycle, August 13, 31, 13 BC. They had a peak, as, I, as you recall, they operated in, in Bakhtun cycles. In the 10th Bakhtun cycle from 435 AD to 830 AD was the peak of their civilization. They said, okay, this is it, this is the big one. And they built as many uh, cities, temple sites uh, uh, through the jungles, still many that haven't even been discovered. They're all coordinated. They're all in the same timing system and, and leaving the long count. You can find some of these places and you find dates hundreds of millions and even billions of years in the past. At precisely at the end of the 10th Bakhtun cycle, 10.0000, 830 AD, most of them had gone. They said, we're shutting it down, experiments done. 
leave the clues, let them figure it out. They left. The ones that didn't go back interdimensionally remain and are the indigenous Maya today. Chief among them are the Quiche Maya in Guatemala and the Yucatec Maya in uh, Yucatan and then the Lacandon in, in Chiapas. The Quiche Maya still keep the long count, the count of days. So they verify, despite the controversy that, that 2012 already happened, <laughs> They verify, no, the date for Aha, which was the first date of the cycle, August 13, 30, 31, 13 BC, and for Aha, December 21st, 2012. That's the end of the cycle. What the, what the Maya knew was that, that the creation of a Babylonian civilization based on erroneous timing factors would create, uh, would create the kind of uh, monstrosity of global civilization that we have today. They left behind prophecies specifically for this time. And the key, you know, all unifying prophecy is the prophecy of 2012. The first stage event of this prophecy was the harmonic convergence of 1987, August 16th and 17th of 1987. Some people might remember that, some people might have participated in meditations that day on August 16th. What was that prophecy about? What did that, what did that say? That prophecy said that a, a whole cycle had come to an end on that day, August 16th. A cycle of what was called 13 heavens and nine hells, which was the cycle basically from the closing down of the Mayan civilization to this point, 25, 26 years short of December 21st, 2012. They said, this is the time, this is the opening of the gates of prophecy. The 144,000 awakened sun dancers get the message on August 16th that then, then we will be, then we will be um, moving into the final cycle. The final cycle is this is the time of prophecy. The sign of that was the supernova 1987A, which was cited about um, six months before the uh, harmonic convergence, the first supernova in more than 400 years, the only supernova in the, in the 13th and final Bakhtun. The whole acceleration, exp exponential acceleration that we've been talking about occurred completely in the 13th Bakhtun. The 13th Bakhtun began in 1618. Galileo, Descartes, beginning of the scientific revolution, the perfection of mechanical time, and the beginning of the industrial age. And the exponential curve since 1960 is now, we're going straight up. Prophecy, so in 1987, the harmonic convergence prophecy said, we've completed the cycle. It means we have, this means that we have 20, 25 years be, to go before the, the real new age begins. The real New Age be won't begin till after 2012. This cycle between 1987 and 2012 was the time when, according to the 2012 prophecy, when humanity has the chance to, to and has the choice to either to either make it hell on earth or heaven on earth, and how. The difference between these two is made is whether the human beings can wake up to the fact that their artificial civilization is destroying the earth and can they make the move to returning to living in the cycles of nature, of the universal cycles. This, is, this was the choice. I happen to be the um, main instigator of the harmonic convergence. I would studied the prophecies. I wrote the Mayan factor for that. And after I wrote that, my in fact, and after the harmonic convergence, I had only one thing on my mind. How in the world are we going to fulfill the 2012 prophecy in a positive way so that it's heaven on earth? How are we going to get humanity to return to living in the natural cycles of the universe? How are we going to 
get to real cosmic consciousness. So that was burning question in my mind because I saw we only got so far with it. A lot of people thought the New Age began then. So I, at that point, by 1989, I left everything in what's called the mainstream world to just to dedicate my life to figuring this out. What I found out was in, in late 1989, I discovered the, 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 the timing frequency, the, law, the first stage of the law of time, is that there's a natural timing frequency, a universal timing frequency, which synchronizes everything in the universe. This very moment, this very instant, this second now, runs everywhere through the universe. It's the same instant. That's how there can be telepathy from one distant place to another, where even light might slow down. Telepathy gets there. The velocity of time is, is instantaneously infinite. It's faster than light. And therefore, time is the carrier of telepathy. So there's a natural timing frequency which, which the Maya mathematically knew was a ratio constant 13 to 20. The, the Sokan, the sacred calendar, is based on that 13 to 20. 13 times 20, 260 day cycle. I saw, when I made that discovery, I saw that the whole of modern civilization was like a runaway truck ready to roll off a cliff because it was operating on timing standards that were, that were unconsciously embedded in its psyche. The clock is glamorized. The watch is glamorized. Everything is based on that. And uh, the civilization is in the process of destroying its support system the biosphere, because it's eating up faster than, than it can replenish in order to keep its machines going. So I said, okay. And I saw the clock and the, and the calendar were based on the 12, and, and, that, cr and, and that creates an unconscious, the, the, the natural universal frequency is 1320 ratio. And I saw there was an artificial timing frequency that was governing the whole of globalization, the global civilization. And that's the 1260, a regular 12-month calendar, a 60-minute mechanical clock. And the combination of those two creates the 1260 timing frequency, which is an unconscious mechanistic timing frequency that is continuously accelerating as the human race expands and as the machine goes faster. And so I saw that 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 was the cause of the human deviation from nature. As long as we're living on that timing frequency, we're going to go farther and farther and farther away from the universal natural cycles. As we go farther and farther away, we get out of touch with our own nature, and we get out of touch with the, with the great nature. I said, what do you do about that? So to me, the solution was, you got to get back into the 1320 timing frequency. I, I had already been experimenting living in, in uh, the Mayan cycles, the 1320 cycles of the Mayan calendar. That's how I discovered that. And so my, my thought was, well, what we have to do is the first step we have to take is to change the calendar. And I, I instantly knew that one of the calendars, that the, one of the many calendars the Maya used was the 13 moon 28 day calendar and I knew that was the natural cycle. If the human race was to be reintegrated with nature, we had to get back into a calendar that calibrates us according to the natural common cycle of the female, 28 day, the mean cycle. Then we are back in our biology. Our biology is in rhythm with the biosphere and that way we can beat the 2012 prophecy and be living, uh, living back in the cradle of nature once again. So that was, uh, that intuition came to me in late 1989 and 1990. I worked on that for a little bit and then over the last uh, 10 years or so I've been going around the planet um, spreading this message. This is basically a message. Please. This is basically, a, thank you though. Uh, this is, this, is, uh, this is fundamentally just simply a message 
And the message is very, is, is, it's, it's, some people say it's like, uh, it's, it's amazingly, it's too simple. Okay? But then we're so addicted to complexity that we, things that are too simple we want to dismiss. It can't be that simple. Yes, it can. And the, 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 the message is this, that to go to, we're all, we're all on the road to 2012 now. No one gets out of here alive. <laughs> I have to go past that 2012. I have to get to the end of the cycle of history. That's what's happening. All of history is winding down. There's reactionaries that don't want it to wind down. There's fundamentalists that are angry because, because, uh, they got, they got too oppressed. Everything. So everything is really, really going absolutely crazy. And it's only going to get crazier. Okay? So, question, what can we do to not be disempowered in the midst of all the craziness? Well, the first step, according to this message, is that we have to change our timing frequency. And the way you change your timing frequency The way you change your timing frequency is you change your calendar. This is a revolutionary tool. Hundreds and thousands of people on this planet today are now making this change. Because they understand the message. We have to change our frequency. If we, as a species, want to avoid the worst, we have to make the shift to getting back in the timing cycles of the universe of nature, of the cosmic order. 13 moons, 28 days. Today is actually the 21st day of the resonant moon. It's, and in fact, it's not Friday. Today is Celio 21 of the resonant monkey moon, the seventh moon of the year. And it's synchronized with another calendar, with the, with the dream spell Tzolkin calendar. So today, also the day, white self-existing wind. So today, you can look it up, and if you got one of those, everyone should get one of these. You can find the resonant moon, a bar and two dots, that's seven. A bar is five and two dots, okay, it makes it seven. The resonant moon, the seventh moon, the totem animal is the monkey. You can find where we are right there. There's going to be a workshop tomorrow between noon and four at the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library where all of this will be gone into so you can get a hands-on practical understanding of what this is. But today is, is you can find it right there, the, the, the Gregorian date is on the bottom there so you can't get lost. Page 31, turn to page 31, you'll see it there and you'll see the Gregorian date, 1.30, and then the resonant moon date, 21. And then you'll see the little, there's a little icon there. That's white self-existing wind, for wind. And every day has an affirmation. Like, for instance, today is white self-existing wind. I define in order to communicate measuring breath. I seal the input of spirit with the self-existing tone of form, I am guided by the power of endlessness. If you don't have one of these calendars, every day there's an affirmation like that. Because we're, we're, we're synchronizing different calendars, different energies. The, the, what I just recited there, that's, that's the 260 day cycle is the fourth dimensional calibrator. The 28-day cycle is the third-dimensional calibrator. So we're just putting a fourth-dimensional and a third-dimensional together. They synchronize precisely every 52 years. Every, on this calendar, if in 52 years, no two days are the same. The 28-day the cycle is a perpetual cycle. Every, every 21st day of every moon is always a celio day every year, but the, the fourth dimensional calibrator changes on it. 
So you get surprises all the time. This is how you can begin to map synchronicity. So like tomorrow, for instance, for the workshop tomorrow will be resonant moon Dolly 22, and it's going to be the day blue overtone night. And then that has its own affirmation. I am power in order to dream. So every, every day has an, has an affirmation like that. So this is, and when you start to living, living on the calendar, you're, you're, you are definitely making a paradigm shift by, by beginning to operate on a totally different, remember a calendar is a programming device. If you have a, cal if you have a calendar that is an absolutely harmonic perfection, and this calendar is a total harmonic perfection. You'll find no flaws in it. Well, then you're going to be programming your mind and your life and your society for harmonic perfection. The reason history exists at all at this point is because the Gregorian calendar is irregular. So there's a secret that very few people know. It runs on 28-year cycles. The 28 years before 2001, for instance, was 1973. That was when the Twin Towers were dedicated. They lasted one 28-year Gregorian cycle. Poof. So I said it was an inevitable event. 28 years before 1973 was 1945. Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the beginning of real terrorism, nuclear terrorism. 28 years before that, 1917, America enters the First World War, the Russian Revolution. 28 years before that, 1889, if you like powers, the Eiffel Tower. Those are programs. They're like the Gregorian calendar plays in big 28-year phonograph record sweeps of time. 2001, you can, you can see how that cycle has gone. Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Twin Towers. Do you want to live on the Gregorian calendar to 2029? The Pentagon hopes it has its new deal completely done in 2012. And by 2029, they want nothing but the whole world. Remember, calendar is a programming device. You can change your program. You can go to that back table afterwards and get information there. And, and um, as was said earlier, you can go down to 500 A Street, second floor, and talk to the people there and get more information about education programs. The Foundation for the Law of Time is a nonprofit organization and it's actually the organizational front organizational front of the 2012 prophecy our our aim is to help people wake up to educate them to, to the fact that they can begin to make a very interesting empowerment in their life by changing their calendar and living on another time this summer july 25 Fifth is going to be, and 26th is, the, is what's referred to as the time of the great calendar change. I said this calendar has been spreading around the world since about 1993, a little over 10 years ago. Um, in Brazil this year, they printed a million of these and gave them away. They're making them... Um, there, you can find them in Japan. You can find many, many different versions of these in Russia. Catching on very big in Russia. And uh, virtually all over the world now, the message is going out that this is the time to change the time. We can do something. And that you can include this with all the other good things that you're doing. Even... Dennis Kucinich, if he has a chance, he knows all about this. So the point is that 
for the 2012 prophecy that we're on the road to 2012, that the world is going to continue to change very dramatically. Some of the Maya elders believe that when we get to 2012, that there won't be too many of us here. That what happens after 2012 is we enter into a whole new age, into a whole new cycle, according to the 2012 prophecies of the, of the tradition that I'm following, that after 2012, December 21st, 2012, then we, we, and we make that, we make it to that point successfully, then on July 26, 2013, there's going to be a point called galactic synchronization. And the galactic synchronization is actually a solar event. All of this is actually a solar event. That's why the Maya talk about the coming solar age. As you know, the sun has been experiencing dramatic changes since 1987. Sunspot cycles have, have been more incredible than, than, than have ever been observed before. Not that we've been observing them for that long, but nonetheless, they've been very dramatic. Uh, sunspot cycles run in 23-year cycles. The last one began and it, has, it peaks after 11 and a half years and then switches polarity, and then completes its cycle. The current sunspot cycle began in 1989, had a big peak in 2000, 2001. It peaks again in 2012. So we're all concurrent with, with the changes in, in, the, in the sun, which is changing our atmosphere as we are changing our own atmosphere. And what is being what is being asked of the of the human beings is to is to get with the program and synchronize again with the cosmic cycles. If we can synchronize again with the cosmic cycles, first of all, just by making the simple change of the calendar, we've made uh, a big step in our evolution. The calendar there's been attempts to change the calendar. People don't know that in one of the major agendas of the League of Nations, the predecessor of the United Nations, was to change the calendar. 97% of the people involved in making the change were in favor of one particular calendar, the 13-month, 28-day calendar. It was promoted by the International Chamber of Commerce and industrialists like Eastman Kodak. At least they said it would make accounting easier. But it didn't happen. There was too much propaganda from the Vatican. And on, on January 1st, 1933, when the calendar was supposed to be changed, it didn't happen. It didn't happen because the 13 moon calendar has 28 days each moon or month. 13 times 28 is 364. The 365th day is no day of the week or month at all. That way the calendar remains perpetual. Now this Resonant moon 21 will always be a celio day, or a, fist, or a Friday if it was going to be like that. It's a perpetual calendar. Ultimately, when you, when you get into this calendar, you see why history is a function of irregularity. There, there is no history in harmony. Everything equalizes out, and there's just more and more intense degrees of beauty and quality. So the 365th day is, is a day out of time. It's no day of the week, no day of the month at all. It's synchronized to occur every July 25th on the Gregorian calendar. So this, this, um, uh, this day out of time, the Vatican argued, if we observe this null day or day out of time, they said it will break the succession of the week which was set in motion by God at the beginning of creation. It was invented by the Babylonians. <laughs> and it was incorporated in the Hebrew calendar. And then the Julian calendar picked it up from the Hebrew calendar. The Vatican said, if we observe a day out of time, it will plunge the world into chaos and terrorism and war. Sound familiar when we look around today. 
the data time is celebrated increasingly around the planet. In Brazil, more than 80 cities recognize the data time as an official holiday of peace and culture. The banner back here is the banner of peace that was brought into the world by Nicholas Rorick, the great Russian artist. In 1928 and 1935, this was uh, the, the principal part of something called the Rorick Peace Pact, which said that this banner, and this was signed by President Roosevelt and all the heads of the Pan American nations as well as many other nations, so that in times of war, this banner should fly over all cultural institutions, historical monuments, things like that. So <clears throat> the 13 Moon Calendar Change Peace Movement has adopted this particular banner because we say that the human civilization is at war with our biosphere, so we should fly this everywhere in the biosphere to, to show the protection of the biosphere, the cradle of human culture. In Brazil, this is on, and on the data times, I said more than 80 cities now observe this, including this year, Sao Paulo, the largest city in the world, has made the data time official holiday, with this official banner for that holiday. In Japan, data time festivals are very, very big. Kitaro is now involved in the, in the annual data time festivals at Mount Fuji, for instance. So we're going to have a very big event here in Ashland this year. And because the data time, July 25th, falls on a Gregorian Sunday, we're going to have a three-day event. It will be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then on July 26th will be proclamations of the great calendar change. The, cal <clears throat> the gist of the calendar change is this. Because already a, 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 a very small but critical minority of people have already made the change. The calendar has changed. We're just moving ahead and we're putting out the invitation to the rest of humanity to join us in making this change so that when we get to 2012 that we have humanity <clears throat> back in the cycles of nature. <coughs> You're welcome. So this is, this is the broad vision of the meaning of being on the road to 2012. And the, the main point of it is that there is real, that there is real hope. There is, this is something that's truly new. Uh, the law of time is such uh, that it, it actually constitutes an entire new science because we've never known time like this before. And we've developed, uh, you can see some of the educational tools that we have that have been developed. Um, there are different levels of understanding and knowledge that you can go into with the law of time. Fundamentally, the law of time describes a new order of reality which is known as the synchronic order. The synchronic order is the fourth dimensional mental order of reality, which is pure synchronicity. Everything is, is in a state of synchronicity, actually. And everything is in a state of telepathy. All of the species have their telepathy, their instinct. The ants know exactly what they're all doing within, among each other, as do the dolphins. We will all have our telepathy, too when we are all synchronized in the natural time, because remember the, the, the velocity of time is instantaneously infinite. That's the carrier of telepathy. When we're all in living in natural time, that telepathy will be restored. And the, form, the other formulation of the law of time is energy factored by time equals art. Energy factored by time equals art. Time being the 1320 frequency. And that's why, as I tirelessly tell people, that's why you've never seen an ugly sunset. <laughs> because it's all art. Everything, absolutely everything, is art. Every, the whole of the universal construct is a huge, huge, fabulous work of art. That's why, that's why we love to, to get out in nature, because that's the unbeatable one. And that's why we try to do our best I used to teach art history, and I always used to say, as plants 
flower humans aren't. <laughs> and that that's, that's our real function. Our real function in nature is to improve the whole quality of life through our skill as artists, as, art, as artful beings. So that's why the organization of the Foundation for the Law of Time, popular organization, is referred to as the Planet Art Network. And the idea is to realize the whole Earth as a work of art. So when we get to 2012, that's our big project, is to transform everything that has become industrial sewage and waste, to transform all of that into a work of art so that the planet itself becomes the greatest work of art that we could ever imagine celebrating. And that's, that's the the purpose of it, because in the, in the natural time, the philosophy is not time is money, but time is art. Everything depends on the quality of what you do. Everything depends on the quality of your interaction with space, with other people, and how you relate to your own time. We're, we have a greater destiny than being consumers. Far greater destiny than that. Uh, we are now in the process See if we can wake up from that particular dream. And that, that the fate of, of humankind was not to build shopping centers and freeways, but to cultivate telepathy, the higher mental spiritual values. There is no more future in physical plane materialist evolution. It has run out of steam and energy. The future of our evolution is mental and spiritual to go to the fourth dimension. We live in the fourth dimension already, but we don't have the tools to know it. Our dreams take us to the fourth dimension and our imaginations take us to the fourth dimension. Whenever we have a synchronicity, we get excited. What if all of life were one continuing synchronicity. We'd get really excited. We wouldn't need movie theaters. When we have telepathy, we won't need the internet. And because everyone will know what everyone else is doing, no one will allow anyone else to send anyone else spam. <laughs> this all starts with one simple change. Change your frequency, change your time, change your mind, create a paradigm shift. This is the most subtle and powerful revolution going on in the planet today, and it's because it's time. It's truly time. Well, I think I've basically spun my spiel <laughs> and uh, given my message. Uh, basically, I am a messenger. I realized I was a messenger some 10 or 11 years ago, and that my sole purpose on Earth is to deliver this message, message of the prophecy of 2012, and what we need to do to begin to make the shift, to make the change, to, to, to stop living on the Gregorian calendar and start living on the 13 moon, 28 day calendar is the first step of our evolution, of our next stage of our evolution. This next stage of evolution will take, will create us into a telepathic organism, a truly planetary human in touch with itself around the planet, which will spring into, into manifestation, what is referred to as the noosphere, the mental sphere of the planet, which obviously operates on telepathy. As that's, that's our, our evolutionary purpose, is to do that. That's what our, that's why we are placed on this earth, that's our particular skill. And then we will have a completely wireless civilization. We will then be able to, to correct our genetic deficiencies that cause us to have shoe stores <laughs> and indoor plumbing. If you'll notice, the other species don't need that stuff. They're not defectively like we are. We're on an interesting learning curve. We'll correct our genetic deficiencies. We'll become the dolphins of the atmosphere. We'll high-wire the noosphere, 
and we'll be in a whole other evolutionary stage. And it begins with changing your timing frequency, getting out of that old program and getting into the natural cycles. That's my message. Thank you very much. There's, there's information back there about the foundation. If you want to leave a donation for the foundation or talk to the people there, thank you. RVML Resource Center is a volunteer-operated federal 501c3 tax-exempt nonprofit organization. RVML is dedicated to providing easy access to a comprehensive collection of information on a variety of metaphysical, spiritual, and personal development subjects. RVML accepts and appreciates all donations. Material and monetary contributions are fully tax-deductible. This recording is not copyrighted and permission is granted to broadcast, exhibit, or duplicate all or part of this program for non-commercial educational purposes. This live presentation was organized and presented by the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library and Event Center. For more information, please visit rvml.org.